Welcome to another fantastic episode of Hollywood Interviews. I am beyond excited. I'm excited about all of them, but I am a gigantic horror movie fan. We've got Beatrice Buckley here with us, joining us on the interview today. Uh, Dustin, are you excited about having Beatrice on? You have no idea. <laughs> yes. This is, this is, oh, that's so cool. <laughs> how, Beatrice, how are you? Uh, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. I'm doing really good. Uh, I just, um, my girlfriend just took me out for a lovely lunch, so I'm very happy. <laughs> Absolutely. Food makes me happy too, yeah. 110%. So uh, we start off the, the question uh, period here with a, with a typical sort of uh, Hollywood type question. How did you get into the industry? And um, just start, start from there, ma'am. Okay. Well, um, my first introduction to acting was when I was a little girl. I was five years old, living in Japan. Um, and we uh, we lived in Japan for four years when I was little. And we, we so I was in all the plays. Um, they did little school plays, and I would play the cat or the dog or the sheep because I couldn't. You know, in the beginning, I couldn't speak Japanese, so I I had to play just animals. And then eventually, I, I learned to speak, but but by then we weren't doing plays, but I, you know, I saw, I really enjoyed that. And then all through uh, elementary school, middle school, high school, I was always in the drama club and chorus. So I, you know, I was in plays, I sang. And I think um, in middle school was, um, I was in Canada at the time. Sorry, I got a little scratch here. <laughs> These are so handy. No, um, anyway, um, by the way, this, isn't this so cool? My friend in Canada. Um, the quality first, the insane. It's really, this one's like really, really sharp. These are amazing. Anyway, That's what you want. It's got to be sharp. Yeah. So it's a great back scratcher. But anyhow, um, in middle school, I was in a play and I had the closing lines of the play. You know, and I was doing all the, you know, whatever. And then when it came to the end, I think my cue, like my, I say something like, um, and in the end, the lights go out, the every, you know, the crowds leave and the stage goes dark or something like that. And that's when the curtain was supposed to drop and the lights were supposed to go out, you know, so the crew all waits on my cue. And I start and I see my parents and they never came to my plays. They haven't seen my movies. <laughs> but anyway, oh, um, no. shocked, I saw them and it just pulled me out of character. And I froze just like that. <laughs> you guys thought I was frozen. No, but anyway, so I just like I completely froze and I'm just standing there. And I couldn't make it. And then so one of the actors on stage is like, and when the curtain comes down or, you know, whatever the lines were. And I heard it, but it still wouldn't come out of my mouth. And then my girlfriend um, um, was off stage. She was the prompter and she says the line quietly and then a little bit louder and a little bit louder. And I'm just like bloody fro. I don't know what the hell. And then finally she screamed out the lines and then they shut the, you know, lights came off and the curtain came down and I thought, Oh my God, I've really blown it. And I still got the best actor trophy that year. So I was like, wow. And that really made me, it was, his name was Derek Peach, my teacher in Canada. Um, he gave me the best actor trophy. So I really got inspired, but, um, so I ended up going to theater school in Canada, um, you know, four year theater program acting major. And um, because we were in Canada at the time, we we're in Vancouver Island. Um, we were right by Vancouver, of course. So Vancouver, as you guys might know, is like the Hollywood North. And like, I don't know, I don't know if 80 percent, I don't know, huge amount of films are filmed there and TV shows, you know, and, and Vancouver's posed as every country in the world. So you know, every type of thing was going there. So it was a really great time. And in the 80s, it was just fantastic for actors. You, you know, you could guest star on so many shows, um, yeah. you know, and I lucked out getting an agent and kind of that's where it went. But um, I, I do want to say one other thing about it. Um, and probably you've heard this from a lot of actors, but I think what drew me to become an actor um, was the escape that it provides because, um, you know, I think most of us have like screwed up childhoods, whatever. And, um, and you know, when things were really traumatic in my life, somehow for me anyway, I don't know, it's weird, but pretending that I was being filmed made it not so bad because then it was like, I was this dramatic character and usually in film, something good happens at the end. So I, I don't know. D do you guys remember that show zoom before this kind of zoom? Yes. Zoom, 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 uh, zoom. Okay. Yep. You're not that young. I mean, you guys look a lot younger than me, but anyway, um, 
so in zoom they always had that section where they would have the kids remember like they would show the day in the life of and it would just be some mm -hmm. kid in cambodia going to school on a boat or whatever it was and i just i loved that because you got a glimpse into other people's lives and so when i would you know whatever happened and you know i, I run outside and i'm crying and i'm we had a little farm for a little while in canada uh, before canada sorry we've lived so many places but we were living mm -hmm. on this little farm and i would be running out and hugging my pony and it was just the weirdest thing like i'm out by myself in the barn and i would suddenly go like like this so that the camera could see my face this imaginary stupid camera you know that I'm, I'm you know instead of petting my pony like this i'd be like this i i was sort of weirdly camera aware at the time so i don't know it's kind of just been this little escape escape thing for me um and and then when i know sorry it's still the same question you get an actor talking and we just never show no, you're it, right? good that's what we want Thank okay you. No. but but the other thing too was um as an actor like you know as as a young girl i i always felt um i felt huge and fat and ugly and i think a lot of that was because i um living in japan from age five to nine and back in the 60s i towered over kids my own age you know they didn't have mcdonald's and they didn't have you know all our yucky <laughs> american food yet and yeah i'll say it i'll say it it can be juicy and whatever but yucky um and it makes you fat you know and so so but so japanese kids were all really skinny at the time and little compared to me and when i look back on pictures that i was totally fine for an american kid i wasn't big but when you looked at me with kids next to me the same age i always was so much bigger than them and so when you're growing and plus they would also run away from me and call me monster gaijin gaijin and gaijin like so monster and foreigner kind of sound quite similar so the kids would like because i was this weird american so they either loved us or hated us and so, you know, I kind of had that impression um, and it's really hard to shake. So then as an actor, you get, I'd get cast in a role and I read it and it says, you know, the gorgeous ingenue or, you know, drop dead gorgeous and these weird little things that I'd be like, what the hell? You know, they describe this beautiful actress um, or this beautiful character. And, but when the camera would go on, I could be this beautiful person. And it's weird, you know, it's just like taking on a character, like, in those moments i could actually feel beautiful and um and then i'd come back you know the camera there's a cut and then it'd be back to me but <laughs> it's a, it's a weird warp thing of acting but it's fun it's an escape no you you mentioned yeah. maybe that other people had said that no you're the first person oh. who has who has said that and yeah. I, I i've always connected in that way as well uh, it's an escape for me my birthday was three days before Halloween. So I love Halloween and dressing up in costumes and the same situation applied later in life. I became a cosplayer, okay. uh, some superheroes, all that stuff. So yeah, it's an escape. You get to be someone else for a right. moment. That's what's my favorite thing about Halloween and being an actor. So I get it. And I'm six foot three. So I've always been much taller. Actually in the opposite, I've always wanted to go to Japan just to see how much taller I am. Than oh my everyone. goodness. Six foot three, you would be towering. I mean, now not so much, honestly, like milk, milk and beef have made japanese people you know um, now they're now they're taller i mean they really are but so you might not stand out quite as much but you still would six foot three you'd still stand out for sure um but my my stepfather who is british i think maybe he's maybe he's six foot or you know or five eleven or something like that oh he towered like towered over everyone and it was great because when we go to these festivals in japan i could always see him through the crowd you know true, his big true, tall head that's yeah. cool. Very cool. Well, thank you for sharing that with us. That's that's fast. Mm -hmm. I like that a lot. Thank you. Yeah, sure. So Beatrice, so something that uh, it's a, it's like a, a running thing between me and Noah is Noah's very first project he got to work on was three billboards over Ebbing's, Missouri, oh. and it makes me super jealous uh, because my first project was uh, was a commercial. <laughs> well, there's but, nothing wrong with a commercial. There is, and, um, especially if it paid well. It it did not. Oh. <laughs> But your first movie also makes me jealous. So you were in Stakeout. How was it being one of your first projects? How, how was that? Oh, my gosh. It was great. Um, <clears throat> I actually, you might, uh, Fangoria. Oh, yep. God. Yep. Yes. Love it. Mm. So Fangoria is, in a way, well, not, not Fangoria itself is responsible, but it helped me get the role. And um, how that was, was I was dating a guy, beautiful, wonderful actor who unfortunately is now he mm -hmm. he, just, he died a while ago riding on a bicycle but um anyway we were you know dating at the time and he said um okay now i'm gonna embarrass myself who who directed stakeout 
not uh, was it Roger Spottiswood or was it um shoot eh oh I'm so bad with names anyway it was a great you know it's a, it's a wonderful director please forgive me director oh you're, you're um, um but it John Badham John yeah John Badham right Badham. so you know I was trying to research a bit about John Badham before the audition and my boyfriend said oh there's an article on him in Fangoria of all things and so I started to read the article and it was something to do with um he did a, some sort of a Shakespearean vampire something I don't know I you know this was decades ago so I really don't remember mm -hmm. but it was something quite interesting and different so when I got to the audition I mean you guys obviously you've both auditioned you know and it's if you make a connection you know if either you're right for the part or not but then if you're in the category of right for the part then it's against you and the other four people that are right for the part so what's going to make you get it over the other person and generally speaking it's once you're down to like the callback and the second callback it truly is just one little something that's just going to put you over the edge of the other person and so having that connection i was able to bring up that article and i was like oh you know oh i read about that you did this blah 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 and it was something very obscure and John was like, oh, you know, and so then he talked back about it and we got into a nice conversation. I, I think that had part of part of the reason I got cast. And originally I was reading for the role of one of the cops, um, you know, which still would have been, you know, nice little scenes or whatnot, possibly more scenes. I don't know. But then they called me back or my agent called me back and said they changed their mind. They want you to play Emilio Estevez's wife. And I'm like, um, OK. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because we'd already seen the Brat Pack, or not the Brat Pack, you know, what what was the thing? Breakfast Club and all yeah, that stuff. So, mm -hmm. yeah. You know, so I totally knew already who he was. And and um, and um part of that, though, you had to be five, five, five or under. Yeah, because he's, he's short. Yeah. yeah. Well, just not vertical. He's, he's what right. do you call it? He's closer to the earth, man. <laughs> That's it. I like that. There you go. And you're closer to the heavens. That's true. I like yeah. positivity. Yeah. It's how you spin it. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah. So no, so it was fantastic. And then, and then Richard Dreyfus were, you know, so both John Badham had just done that really cool. Um, oh my God. Oh, oh, what did John Badham do? Didn't he do that um, with a cow, uh, not cowboy with a um, robot? Short circuit. Did he do short circuit? Short circuit. Wasn't it short circuit? Anyway, it was something he had just done that I had really loved at the time. And then, of course, Richard Dreyfus um, and Emilio. So, um, and Richard Dreyfus was phenomenal to work with, like really, really a kind. Like he went overboard, you know, in kindness. And Emilio, and we all connected. I mean, we spent time, it was in Vancouver, and we went out for meals. And, you know, and Emilio stayed, we've stayed in contact ever since. Um, yeah, it was a phenomenal experience. I loved it, loved it, loved it. Yeah. That is awesome. Awesome. Absolutely. Yeah. That's excellent. Um, my next question, of course, is about movies. So m most folks would know you, of course, as Amanda Kruger. And the you're, you're part of the DNA. You're part of the fabric of a horror icon in a franchise. Awesome. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's it's hard for me and Dustin, you know, not to fanboy all over that. And I'm sure you get that all the time. But so when you go to conventions and you make appearances, does does it ever get old that people immediately come up and recognize you for that or do you ever want to be like I've been in other things yeah well I, I I do kind of like it's a little hard when you know like in those two behind me quarantine and matinee there's low budget Canadian films and quarantine like I'm the lead you know I'm the hero running yeah. around oh, you know yeah. and, and so many of us you know wouldn't ever get a chance to be a lead in a film you know and matinee is a pretty it's a ensemble cast and have, you know, I have a nice meaty role, you know, and, you know, and people have no idea, you know, never really heard of those things. So sometimes it's a little, hmm, but at the same time, you know, I, I sit there with Danny Hassel and um, he, he served in six, um, six times. What is it when you serve over in Iraq? What a is tour. it called? Six tours, tours, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Six tours. This, this guy has, you know, he's truly faced death. I mean, I, you know, I, I don't want to openly talk, but of course he has had to oh, yeah. end people's life. You know, he's like, you can't get more dramatic than that. You can't get bigger than that to me. You know, he's, he's, he's saved lives for our country, done mm -hmm. this like phenomenal stuff. And people are wanting his autograph as Danny. Like, I, you know what I mean? Like, I, so I can't, I can't complain because I, it, 
imagine that, like sitting next to him, like I, he's, he, I, I just think about that when Danny, what, what, what would that feel like when you've done something, you've put your life on the line for a country. And it's, I'm not saying that it's a bad thing to be known for doing Elm Street, not at all, but just that comparison, the thing that you just mentioned, it's like, yeah, it's, it's sometimes a little weird. Conversely, it's fucking phenomenal. Like, it's just Absolutely. like, you know, uh, and I think my fans know, I don't want to, you know, I don't think I'm saying anything uh, new here. I didn't originally appreciate at all what this franchise was. Not, <laughs> most of us didn't, hardly any of us did. Yeah. It was in the 80s and, you know, we did the film and, and because it was number five, I did know about Elm Street by that point. Of course, I knew what it was and I had seen Elm Street 1 in, in the movie theater, but um, the, it hadn't been my genre. You know, horror films was not at the time something that I really liked. And so I didn't tell my family, I didn't tell anyone I was even in it. Like, I just didn't. It was. It, you know, whatever. I, I kind of threw it threw it off. Even though I knew I played Freddy Krueger's mom, I just kind of, yeah. I knew my family would never watch it, so why tell them? Um, you know, and then to, so many decades later to come to realize what a huge thing it is and how much it has impacted the fans. And the first few times I did cons, I did a couple way back, right after the um, Never Sleep Again. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't even know that there were such things as conventions for horror films. I just had no clue about it. I, I think I'd heard something about the Star Trek, Trekky people, you know. And yes. I knew that there was those kind of things. I think because a couple of TV shows spoofed them, right? I think Seinfeld or you know some. Yeah. So I knew the, those things existed, but I had no idea there was ones for horror, and certainly not for our film. I just I don't know why. And doing Never Sleep Again, it was Toy Nurk. Newkirk said to me, you know, how come I never see you at the cons? And I was thinking, you know, cons, what the hell, cons? I didn't know what she meant by cons, you know? And she explained to me and she said, you know, people come, they get, you know, and you can make some money. And I'm like, what? You know, people want my autograph? What are you talking about? You know, and so we, they set up a few. I went to a couple there. There was a couple number five reunions, which was phenomenal. It was just so much fun. And I loved the people I met. But I remember we were all kind of, I think it was like Danny's first one. Lisa had been doing them all along. But um, for the rest of us, Erica, I think most of us had never done them before. And we're all kind of sitting there a little dazed. You know, people are coming up and asking for our autograph and talking to us and being all interested, you know. And it, it was kind of an out of worldly experience at the time. Um, but it did remind me of, there was one time way back shortly after doing Elm Street, um, probably after it came out, um, which was right in the same year, um, my agent called me and said that they needed, that I was called to Salt Lake City for a, a Jerry Lewis telethon fundraising <laughs> thing. And it was some horror, uh, what do you call it, a haunted house. Yeah. So they have this big haunted house they do every year. And so they were flying me out. I was going to um, meet with the actors who were in the haunted house, do a little workshop on horror film acting, um, and then sign autographs at the haunted house and do a few radio interviews. So I was like, okay, you know, I, they, they want to do this and they're paying me and they're flying me out. And my agent's <laughs> like, yeah. And so I was thinking to myself, I said, I said to my agent, you know, what do I do? Like, who, you know, uh, you know, I was just an actor and a, a poor actor at that. You know, I didn't have clothes. I don't mean bad actor, poor, <laughs> you know, I, I didn't have any nice clothes to wear, whatever. And I was thinking, what do I do? And he says, just make it a character, be a celebrity. They want to see a celebrity. They don't want a you know, shy, embarrassed, you know, humble person. They want to know a celebrity. Don't be afraid, name drop, do all that stuff. And I was like, okay. So I came up with a character that this Beatrice Bupley was that she was, you know, friendly and outgoing, you know, but she would name drop and whatever. And I played that role. And like, cause they, they came to the, you know, airport picking me up and it was, and all these, you know, young kids who were doing the haunted house, you know, their jaws were dropping at meeting me and all this stuff. And, and then I, I'll never forget um, one of the boys. Um, I mean, I wasn't that much that old at the time, but he, he comes up, he goes, you know, Miss Bupley, you know, we have one of the first in, um, drive in burger places in all of America. You know, we'd love to show it to you. Would you be interested? And I'm like, sure. And they're like, really? And I'm like, yeah. And so it's like four or five of the actors and they, they pull up in their car and then they're being all apologetic about their car. And I was like, you should see my car. I mean, holy smokes. <laughs> and I was driving around LA with no insurance. I had come from Canada. It's terrible. But anyway, so I get in their car and we go. And then when the, when the bill, you know, we all ordered burgers and when, when the bill came, you know, what would have been 30 bucks, 20 bucks for all five of us. So I paid for it. 
And they were like, oh, you know, Freddy Krueger's mom paid for our meal. And they were so stoked. And and I think I learned that from, um, oh, no, it disappeared on us. Oh, no, you're good. Oh, I'm good. No, I'm you disappeared. Yeah. Um, but but I, had, I had been the um, stand-in for Nancy McKeon. Do you remember her? Facts of yeah. Life? Yeah. Yep. Oh yeah. She so she did a movie on the um about the first woman firefighter. Uh, anyway, it was some TV, maybe movie for TV. So I was her stand-in, and um, I think it, Amanda was it was it that film that Amanda Wiss was in. Well, mm -hmm. anyway, so mm -hmm. some blonde blonde actress was in it, and um, Kelly um, uh, come on, brain. Oh, <laughs> Michael J. Fox. Kelly Fox is Michael J. Fox's sister. Yes, and, yes. and she was the other stand in. So, so we were all just having so much fun. And Nancy took us all to, um, to get a bite to eat one night and paid for the whole thing. And I just remember like how memorable that was that, you know, somebody I'd watched cause I loved that show facts of life, you know, so somebody I'd watched on TV all this time and here she was taking me out for a meal and same deal, you know, it wasn't that expensive, but just that small gesture meant so much to us. So I've always remembered that. And, and I and the more I've learned, um, the more I've connected with my fans, which has really only been in the past year since um, my my own boys have gone off to school, mm -hmm. and now I'm an empty nester. Um, I have a lot more time, and I've spent time on Facebook getting to know my fans. I you know I've asked them like, why do you like horror? What do you like about yeah. it? And and I've learned a lot about how what a huge impact it's made on people. And you know, even when I'm acting, like when I worked with amazing actors, I I worked with um Catherine Hepburn on a TV movie of the week. I did um, um, you know, and she she autographed a book for me and everything. And I did, you know, um, Sidney Poitier, I, Richard Dreyfuss, uh, John Johnny Depp, you know, all these people. And certainly, there's a lot of actors I admire, but and I don't know if you guys, but you know, working with, you know, we are all actors, and and we we all. You know, and as an actor, you know that if you get that right break, if it's that right role, the right place at the right time, you could skyrocket to fame if you want fame um, or not. But, in you know, we're all people, you know, you know, so, so it's it's fine to be a fan, but also, you know, and, and certainly we all are. But I also don't ever put people on a pedestal. And by not putting people up on a pedestal, I also don't put people below. You know what I mean? Like my fans, th there's no such thing as this film. This film um, franchise would not be alive if it wasn't for the fans. If it wasn't fans still yeah. loving it, wanting to watch it again, wanting to get our autographs. You know who else? You know who else would want our autographs? So, you know, so I'm I'm just keenly aware of that. And um, when now that I. The, this past year, I started really going to conventions. I've been going to quite a few. I'll be going to quite a few more. And um, I, I feel honored to meet my fans. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it, and it's um, humbling to know that, um, you know, just by connecting with people, it can make such a difference for people, you know, in their lives. Yeah. Like I, Facebook, I've noticed a lot. Like there's, you know, especially with COVID in this past few years, freaking everybody's depressed. Like so many people are depressed and, and unfortunately quite a few people are even like suicidal or, you know, I don't know, maybe it's a common thing to complain on Facebook. I'm not sure. But when mm -hmm. I see people reaching out on Facebook, like saying, you know, I, I'm, I want to give up, you know, I write back to them and I, I encourage them because, you know, if, if, if hearing from somebody they admire, you know, is enough to make them hold off from doing something stupid and, and, and trying to take a, another look at life. Oh my God, what an, a, what a great thing that is, you know? So I feel honored if I can, you know, I don't know, do something nice for somebody. That, that's simply incredible. Um, that's just a testament to your, to your character that you do that because I've also dealt with the opposite with an actor that wouldn't give anyone the time of day. Oh. Um, and that's just never, to, you're never going to be that way. You have to stay humble and you got to be a person. Now, okay. if I ever had like an action figure of myself made, like that you have, I would spend a day with a little bit bigger of a head. I would like <laughs> put it on the shelf and just stare at it for like a long time. But after that, no, that's what it's about. We're just, we're all people. We need to be connected. And like you said, especially with the pandemic, everyone felt so disconnected. Right. To, for, for you to even come on our show too, um, just is, is a wonderful thing and a wonderful example of how how another human should help another person, especially when that person you know is a part of their childhood, which you're a part of ours as well. So 
Um, thank, thank you, you for that perspective. Yes, you are. Oh, thank sure. And no, oh, thank you. Thank you. I, in fact, I was talking to my agent about, you know, the whole thing with, with, um, at, at conventions and, and the pricing for autograph signing, it's helping to pay for my kids college. So I, I super appreciate it. I really do. But, um, you know, I've heard of some actors who charge, you know, some of the big actors charge big bucks. I do. And it's kind of like, I don't know, that makes me wonder because I don't know if you're a multimillionaire, do you really need to be charging that much for people? And you know what I mean? Like when you're at that point, you're like, you know, you're going to these conventions and you're this huge mega star. You don't really need the money. So one would assume you're doing it for your fans. Right. And yeah. so charge a reasonable amount. You know why? Exactly. I, I just don't get it. Like I, I honestly, there's one actor um, and I don't know the name. I apologize. Um, but my agent w represents her and apparently, God, I should find out. I should text him. I can let you guys know later. But anyway, she she's been in some horror films. Not I don't know, um, not ones that I've seen a, a different franchise. In any case, she refuses to take money for autographs. Oh, wow. But what she but what she wants. But at the same time, you know, she has enough self respect that you know the convention shouldn't necessarily get all the money. You know that her name is bringing. Yeah. So mm -hmm. she just wants a guarantee from the convention, like have them pay her but then the fans get it for free, which I thought, frick, that's amazing. That would be that's really amazing. good. Well, places are not booking her. Nobody's booking her. That's dumb. Like, I'd book her in a heartbeat. That's right? crazy. Yeah, oh. you know, so I think, I mean, that's the kind of thing, like, you know, in, you know, and I think about this all the time, like with with money and, and such, you don't want to be taken advantage of. Like if your name is a draw and and somebody else is going to get rich off of, it, off of it, well, no, you should get a piece sure. of that. For sure. But that's why, like, it would be so nice. Wouldn't it be great if conventions could, like, hire the actors, you know, they pay the actors because then that sells the tickets and that's going to mm -hmm. get the crowds in. But the actors then can just give their autograph for free. God, fans, you know, that would be the best case scenario. Or, or do a certain, or, you know, 20 bucks per autograph for a, for a good cause or, you know, as, you know, especially the really rich ones, but, you know, whatever. <laughs> Yeah, I, uh, that's one of my pet peeves. I could talk about that forever. Yeah. Yeah, no, I was I, gonna say going to conventions. I here in the past couple of years, I've really started going more and more. And I, yeah, I've noticed I, it feels like the people that charge, like the the big A listers who charge uh, the lower amounts, they're the ones that really want to be there. And then yeah, the ones that charge more, it's like, why? Yeah. It, like really? Yeah. Yeah, that's a little. You've made it. You're huge. You've got the money. Yeah. It, you know. Plus. Give, Plus you're getting, they pay to fly you out and put you up and feed you. And it's not like it's coming out of your pocket. So. Right. Exactly. Uh, uh, speaking of though, you, you name drop Johnny Depp. That's right. You were, you did some 21 jump street. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I did 21 jump street, me and Johnny. Um, oh, hi. Well, anyway, I have p pictures on Facebook. Yeah. So I was a guest star on one of the episodes, um, that was filmed in Vancouver as were so many things. Um, but I got to work with John, uh, Johnny Depp, the two of us. So I was playing the character of a, you know, teenager. I, I always looked younger for my age. Um, I'm actually 85. Not, you don't look a day past 25. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I actually, I just turned 60 um, on Monday, on February 7th. I turned 60, I but anyway. It. No, well, I, I, don't, I don't believe that at all. <laughs> I think it's the Asian. And I, I promise I'm telling you with God's honest truth, I haven't done any face work or anything. It's it's I'm part Chinese. My my grandfather's Chinese was oh, you know, or is. Or, <laughs> would you say was when they've died? Like they, they were like Chinese. He is, I mean, he yeah. is Chinese. Like he's dead, he's right? But that on to you and, you know, your folks. Yeah. Oh. yeah. So my grandfather, because if you say my grandfather was Chinese and then, what, now? then yeah. what did he turn into now? Yeah. Now he's Italian, <laughs> but back when he was Chinese. No. Um. Yeah, so Chinese and, and maybe doing yoga. I don't know. My mom and my hair, like nobody believes. My girlfriend was yelling at me at lunch today because I don't have any gray yet. And I'm I'm 60, you know, and, and she's like, I've been dying my hair since I was 20. And I said, I don't know. It's it's anyway. But so so with Johnny Depp. So, you know, it was all the idea that it's adults, you know, playing kids. Yeah. Ooh, <laughs> Noah's a ghost. He keeps disappearing on us. I am just... oh anyway, um, but so I was like kid in high school and and Johnny's character is you know undercover and he comes to our high school they're trying to track down some whatever drug deal I can't remember if the guy did drugs or 
money, something. In any case, so my class is, um, I'm part of this um, game show. The, the school is on a, on a um, what is that? You know, when you go and you answer questions, <laughs> you know, those like kind a, of shows. Like a quiz show, like a debate. Like a quiz show. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And so Johnny gets on the team with us. Um, but because he's actually an adult, he can answer all the questions. And so we start winning and we start winning and, we're, and you know, and I'm getting all excited and everything. And to this day, my husband teases me because there's, they took one stupid take of mine. Like, I really look like a total goof. I, um, my character finds out that we're going to be on TV, our team. So I'm all excited, which then leads to Johnny Depp's character being freaked out because he's like, oh, he can't do TV. He'll, his undercover will be blown. So... I'm supposed to say, we're going to be on TV, excited. <laughs> and if you look at it, I'm like, we're going to be on TV. Like, I really, I, ooh -hoo, you know, <laughs> I don't know what, what the heck I was, I don't know. But anyway, I look like really ridiculous. And that's the take that they use. So my husband's always like, whenever I'm excited about anything, he goes, gosh, we're going to be on TV. You know, that's amazing. Like, slap, slap, slap. But yeah, <laughs> no, it was great fun. That whole team was like a, a crazy group of kids to work with or young adults or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. But, and, and luckily I wasn't, you know, Johnny Depp at the time, you know, I wasn't all, you know, he, he was already by that point, like a teen idol on tiger beat and stuff, but mm -hmm. he wasn't like the great actor, you know, that we've seen that he is, or, you know, this crazy dramatic actor. I, I, I thought of him as a teen beat guy too. So I wasn't, you know, at least I wasn't gaga and unable to speak, <laughs> you know, excellent. Yeah. Cool, cool. Um, my, my next question is um, actually about yoga. So that's a big part of your life. Um, and I, I, I myself are maybe the novice. I don't know if novice is the right word. But um, so how has yoga impacted your life? And is it something because it's not just physical, it's spiritual in a mind space. So I would assume it might be beneficial as an actor to maybe would you would you consider maybe someone taking on yoga or learning yoga just for more than just a self thing, but maybe for, for their roles or something, anything in life. Yeah. Really. Well, I, I can't say enough about yoga. I mean, honestly, yoga, um, for me, I was introduced to yoga when I was five and I'm mm. 60. So do the math. It's been a long time. And it was again, back when we were living in Japan and my parents who've always been seekers, my mom and my stepfather, um, were studying Zen Buddhism at the time and so they would take my sister and i to the zendo where you know where you do meditation every saturday and um looking back on it i think it was a because it was in the 60s and because the, nobody had ever seen some weird western family my mom looks half chinese she's half chinese half german and then my stepfather's british and he's tall and then there's my blonde sister and me who i thought i looked totally japanese because i had dark hair i thought nobody would know i was not japanese <laughs> But anyway, um, but they don't let kids sit there and do this meditation, but they let us because they didn't, I, I don't know, I guess they didn't know how to say no to my parents. So, sure. and plus we were good. So it, we'd be lining up in the rows, um, you know, on, on the tatami floor and everyone faces the wall and you sit, you know, quietly in meditation and the monks would come by and they had this like bamboo clacker thing and it would, you know, whack on your shoulder if you started to fall asleep or if your mind was too busy or unfocused, somehow they knew and they'd come by and just whack you to kind of wake you up. It wasn't painful, but it was shocking. Um, and I was too young to have, um, I don't even know what the term is and you guys probably wouldn't know anyway in Japanese, but you you had this one-on-one -on -one with, the, with the master um, hmm. and that they wouldn't let me do. They did let my sister do it, who was three years older than me. And so she's lorded that over me my whole life that she got to sit in with a, with a master and he would like to say a Quran or something. He would say, uh, no, not Quran. That's, that's, um, that's uh, Muslim. Ko, koan, Quran, Quran. Anyway, it's a Japanese, you know, a, a Buddhist, um, not a quiz, like a little, uh, what's the word? Like a, oh, like a riddle? Like a riddle, yeah. You know, so he would ask a little riddle like, why does the flower blossom in spring? You know, and you have to have some deep meditational thought on that. Um, yeah, so anyway, um, a bit back to yoga. So what my mom would do was to have a yoga teacher come to our house and teach, a, work, do a little yoga with us before we'd go because we had to sit in meditation for an hour. And I mean, for an adult to do it is almost impossible, but for a kid, you know, 
to sit for an hour was pretty intense. And so it helped kind of, it helped with our bodies. And so that was my first introduction to yoga. And then throughout my life, it just kept coming back. Um, and in 1987, I met my spiritual teacher, um, who I don't know if you guys uh, saw or read the book, Eat, Pray, Love. Uh, but when she's in India, that she was in the ashram with me. It was my ashram, and um, that was this. That was our guru. But anyway, um, so yeah, so it's it's been an integral part of my life, and the philosophy of yoga um, is just so so important for me. You know, it, it it's not a religion. It doesn't belong to any religion. I mean, my the my teacher's training was Kashmir Shaivism. Um, and it kind of goes into Hinduism, but the idea that, you know, it, it kind of flows along the lines of karma, you know, things happen for a reason, um, mm -hmm. and what you put out is going to come back to you, um, you know, and also, and about this duality of life. So it, it, it just got me through some um, really difficult times. My, my daughter died in my arms, um, uh, when right after she was born in real life. And, um, and then I also lost two others, two other babies, um, late term pregnancy. Um, I was already big with both of them and, mm -hmm. you know, to come out of the hospital after gaining all that weight. And, you know, you said, I can say anything. <laughs> so your, breasts, your breasts are heavy with milk. I mean, seriously, you're there, you know, your body's prepared to nurse a child and to come out empty handed is, um, mm -hmm. so painful. And, so I had lost, I had had one son and then I lost two. And I said to my husband, I can't go through this anymore. Um, and, uh, in fact, I was riding horses and doing all this crazy stuff, not realizing that I actually had gotten pregnant, um, <laughs> the third time. And then when I had my third child, uh, my, no, the third one died. I'm sorry. The third one is the one that died after that. I said, I couldn't have any more. And my fourth one, my fifth one, was my son that lived, but he was born with half a heart. Um, and so he had to have uh, three separate open heart surgeries. Um, and we were told when I was pregnant with him, when they found out that he has what's called HLHS, mm -hmm. hyperplastic left heart syndrome, the um, they said, you you should abort because most likely it's it's not compatible with life and he's going to you know, die within minutes of being born. So my husband and I researched like crazy and we found that um, at a couple hospitals, they were doing this three-part open-heart surgery that they do over the first three years of their lives, and kids were surviving. And um, to this day, they don't know how long they will live with this repair to their heart, but um, my son's 18, and he's going to college right now, So, um, and he became an Eagle Scout, and you know he's, he's just doing great. So um, yoga back to yoga. Um, I didn't forget the question. The um, philosophies that I've learned from yoga really helped me through that really dark time where I, I just, you know, it. So yes, I think everyone should do some yoga. And there's a way to, um, in terms of the physical yoga, there's adaptations to every pose. So absolutely anyone can do it. I teach a class every on Fridays to the um, seniors for a local library. And yes. um, one of the guys is in a wheelchair with a um, he needs to, he has a air thingy so he can breathe. Um, and he's doing my class. I mean, you, you can be in any shape, any wow. age, any whatever you could be bedridden and I could teach you yoga. There's things you can learn. So look it up, you guys, if you've never tried it and, it, and for men who think, oh, yoga is all the, you know, skinny little girl. Well, first of all, that would be nice, right? <laughs> if you're a guy, why not? I don't know why more <laughs> men don't come and do a yoga, yoga class sit at the back of the room. No, that's terrible. I'm sorry. You should not do that. <laughs> but anyway, but yoga was practiced for 4,000 years in India with only men. Women were not allowed. So oh, well. it was a man's thing for the longest time. So don't think it's just all for girls. Only in the U.S. we, we kind of took it over, but um, it's, it's definitely for men and women. Thank you so very much for sharing in that deeply personal story with us. Uh, I can't imagine, uh, unimaginable. I'm, I'm a father myself. Uh -huh. uh, my oldest kid is, she turned 18. So she's going to be graduating high school going off. And um, yeah, I, I don't know what I would have done. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's unbearable. It's un it's, thank you for sharing that with us. Thank yeah. you. 18. So where's, where's she thinking of going? 
So, so she wants to be in culinary. Um, okay. So uh, she wants to be a chef. So there's Ooh, a couple yeah. different places. Oh, absolutely. And and in Charleston, South Carolina, where we are at, that's food is king. Yeah. So uh, she can work at a thousand different places or or travel off. I'm. Uh, my parents were sort of had a, a you know a little bit more of a stranglehold on what I should do, and okay. I want her free as she wants to be and pursue her dreams so oh fantastic my one of my girlfriends who's who's got a daughter who's gone into culinary oh my god they eat so well you know she's oh, always god. posting all the stuff that her daughter's making and i'm like ah oh. although i love to cook too so my my boys actually both of them um have learned to cook and they they they've been doing a lot of cooking even in college so i'm kind of impressed it's fun it's fun yeah, i enjoy it well. it's so fun yeah that's awesome all right so speaking of horror and that you play Amanda Kruger, one of the big things that's going on right now is the revival of these horror franchises. It, uh, I'm, I, it'd be cool if they did, and I don't know if they're going to, this isn't a spoiler or anything for anybody, but if they did, if you got the call to come back as Amanda, would you do it? <laughs> oh my, in a freaking heartbeat. You know, I was yes. thinking, of, I was thinking about it. Um, You know, there's some, you know, because um, Nan Martin had played Amanda in number three, mm -hmm. and I, I'll be 100% honest, when I did number five, I didn't even know that they ever had, Amanda had been in mm -hmm. the other ones. I didn't know that somebody else had previously played it. Um, and I'm glad I didn't because, you know, then I would have watched it and then been all like, you know, and I, I don't think it's a big conflict. I mean, we look different, sure, but, you know, heck, you know, so does Freddie and it's him, the same guy, you know, exactly. playing it, you know, so... Um, you know, and I don't think there was anything hugely in conflict either because she's, when she appeared, it, you know, she's coming back as, well, I did too. We both were dead <laughs> when we appear. We're both dead <laughs> nuns coming back. But I was brought back, as I say, to give you life. Um, and now I must take yours. I was, sorry, I'm, I got my ring stuck in my sweater <laughs> as we're talking. So I'm kind of struggling down here. Okay. But anyway, um, uh, I'll just let it dangle there and just don't forget it. Um, it's, but a anyway, look. it's a look. Yeah. yeah, you know, it's that ring, ring. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, it is yeah. a new look. Next week, everybody's going to be wearing that. Everyone's going to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, what I was going to say was with Amanda. Oh, so, you know, I was, people were like, oh, you were so young when you gave birth to Freddie, you know, and, you know, you're so much younger than Robert England. And I was like, well, dudes, you know, he was a baby. When I give birth, he's a baby. So his mom should be younger. So if they did, I couldn't play that again. You know, I couldn't play, like, if they did a revival or if they did a prequel of his, you know, childhood. Unfortunately, I, I don't think I could play Amanda, certainly not giving birth to him when he, you know, cause that should, she should be quite a bit younger, but um, I could certainly play the older one. I could certainly play the Amanda ghost mom <laughs> and, and at any age, right? Um, which, which brings me to my book. Dun, dun, dun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I've been working on the, the backstory of Amanda Kruger, which leads all the way up to Freddie. And his birth and beyond. Um, okay, so I am I am annoyed by this. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, there I got it off. Yay! Hi. Um, Hi. So I've been working on it, and I I've been working with. Um, so I have a number of amazing artists that I'm. You know, I I was I was torn between should I make it a graphic novel, which I think would really play well for people. But I'm, you know, there's a lot of story that's coming out, so it might be more like a novelette like a shorter novel, but definitely yeah. with illustrations, you know, um, and I, you know, I was always, I was so intrigued by this one. I, you guys have seen. Oh, wow. Oh, that's yeah. amazing. Yeah. You know, and, and what's captured in her eyes, like, first of all, that yeah, it's definitely me, you know, you yeah. definitely, you know, and, but it just captures what Amanda is to me. And she's, you know, I've lived with this woman for 32 years and, you know, her background, like as an actor, you know, when I got the role, of course, I had to come up with a backstory mm -hmm. and that's without having seen all the other ones. So I really didn't know the, the film backstory, but, you know, mostly like her relationship with Freddie and what that would be like. And I hadn't even had kids at the time, but, you know, I instinctually know it's, you can't, I, I don't care what the kid did. If it's your child and you've carried them inside you to try to destroy them is, is heartbreaking. You know, yes. and, and I tried to convey that, like I tried to convey, she wasn't happy about doing this, you know, it, it was not a, you know, an easy task for her. And, and it's so interesting because the backstory of Amanda Kruger, um, 
really feeds well into what made Freddie the way he is. Um, and I'm sticking true to every reference in the films. Like there's nothing that's going to be contrary other than what's already in the films, which if you really take it apart and do timelines, they don't always all match up, <laughs> but mm -hmm. I'm trying to stay within the film's history. Um, and all the characters that are mentioned and all the history of Freddie and his, you know, his stepfather and all that stuff. Um, and there's a backstory to that too, what made the Alice Cooper character the way he is and, mm -hmm. and why did Amanda become a nun and who gave him that, made him that sweater, hint, hint. <laughs> oh, I like this. Yes. So there's a lot of really fun, interesting stuff for her background. And, um, and not only um, does the, uh, the folks in England really want me to get it before I get, I'm doing the, um, Hampshire Horror Con. Yes, Hampshire Horror Con in New Ham Oh, darn it, B. I was going to, I can't say this wrong. Yes, the Hampshire Horror Con, which is in Southampton, Hampshire, England, this fall. And there's going to be a ton of us. So there's some, you know, I can say the ones that have been announced. So Mark and Kim from two, mm -hmm. and from five, myself, Danny, Witt, um, for sure. But there's others that are coming oh, and wow. also other franchises. But um, so I want to have the book, if possible, ready for there. Um, mm -hmm. And I, and I, uh, but the other thing was b because there's been talk of doing a re you know, something with Elm Street, oh. especially if they do a prequel, I want to get my story out first. <laughs> Absolutely. 110%. Yeah. You know, you know, cause I've, I, you know, if these other guys do it and you know, it's people who they haven't lived with Amanda. They have not. For 32 <laughs> years. I have, I've been that boy's mother and, um, yeah, there's a lot to, I think there's a lot to her character and his story. So that's something I'm working on and excited about. That's awesome. Well, Beatrice, we've loved having you on the show. Uh, I would say let the folks know what you're, what you got going on, but I think you just dropped it on us. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the big one that that book is going to be big. Um, I will obviously make announcements about it more as it, as it, as it comes forward. And um, yeah. Yeah. I, 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 that? Will, was that Noah? I was gonna say we'll we'll make sure to um to link all your social media so the fans watching this can sort of stay up to date on that and when it's released and everything. Please because do. I am so excited. I know everyone else will be as well, but um so that way they can they can follow through on that and whenever it drops, go out and get it. Because that's Super. gonna be amazing. Thank you. Oh, one thing I did. Yeah, I wanted to say about social media. Oh, my gosh. What a thing. Social media. Right. You know, for a 60 year old lady, it's it's like this weird, odd thing. But um, so I didn't even, you know, I, as I told you, I just started to get more involved with Facebook this year, you know, this past year, res responding to fans and, you know, just all this connection, which there's good and bad with that. You know, there's like freaks, um, like seriously, like weird people that send you. Yeah things they shouldn't be sending, <laughs> you know, which made it really hard because, you know, I used to even, you know, I was, I was direct message, you know, and I don't have a lot of time, but when, when I do, I, I try to respond to people mm -hmm. and I've gotten to the point where I just, I can't even open, I don't want to look because unless it's somebody I know, it's like, yuck, okay. you know, I just, I've had to, I've, I, my block list is probably as big as my follow list, but, um, but Instagram was something my, my rep told me, you got to get an Instagram account. So I started one, uh, I think, a month ago, mm -hmm. um, you know, and then I'm looking like Lisa and Danny and stuff and Mark, you know, it's like 10,000, 15,000 followers, you know, and I've got like 30 or whatever, you know, I started off. And so I've got, I think up to about 600 something right now, yeah. um, which I guess probably isn't bad in a month. Um, and, but when I look at these like tens of thousands, what, like, do we want, do we need followers? If you're trying to sell something, yes, you know, like if you or you, but in my case, if you're trying to get invited to some of the bigger cons, I didn't realize that the foreign ones, which is what I really would love to do too, is you know I want to get to Japan again. Um, it'd be just so fun to go, uh, you know, on at, at, in a convention, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but what they do is they will look immediately at your Instagram and your social media, and they see how many followers, and that determines whether they think you'd be worth bringing to a convention. So unless I get like large numbers of followers, it seems like I'm totally unpopular and they won't bring me out. They will. And it's, it's a growth <laughs> thing. Bring her y'all. If you're watching this, gosh, come on now. Don't make her cry. We need to have you Japan. If you're listening, we got fans in Japan. We're big in Japan. I'm six foot three in Japan. We got right. people that are coming out. Um, yeah. But otherwise you know, I'm going right. to cry. 
I'm going to cry right on screen. Media, uh, apparently, that's how you value people now is through likes. On. Right? Like how many likes? Like I, 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 there's a part, especially in the yogic way of thinking, like it's so anti, you know, it's so anti-yoga and anti-Zen because um, I, know, I know we're supposed to be done, right? Sorry. Can I say one more thing? Okay. So what, when, when I was, I, I, I think I said, right, I lived in India. Mm -hmm. Did I mention that? Yeah. So I was living in India for two years in the ashram. And one of the amazing things that was at, right after I'd done Elm Street, I left, I left Hollywood. Well, I left the States, but not to do with film. I left because I was trying to end a relationship mm -hmm. <laughs> with, you know, codependent. We could just kept coming back together, coming back together 10,000 times. So what do you do when you want to break up with somebody? You move to India, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah. So I moved to India. Um, and what was so amazing was after all these years as an actor where, you know, they, you know, look at your weight and judge you on your looks and your height and your this and that in the ashram, we all had to wear just like Punjabis and, mm -hmm. and there were some pretty darn famous people there, you know, I won't say names, but, and it doesn't matter what you did as a career. It doesn't matter how much money or you have or don't have. You sweep the floors, you clean the toilets, you do whatever job your teacher tells you. Um, and we all wore the same stuff and you're judged on who you are inside. You know, it had nothing to do with who you are on the outside. And it was such a relief that, you know, to just see how wonderful that was to develop that inner person and not have to worry about all these superficial crappy stuff. So a, it made it hard to think about going back to acting, but B with social media, it's like, like trying to earn likes, like that's so anti, like I'm who I am. You either, you know, are you interested in me or you're not, you know, if you're interested, but we have to put ourselves out there because people who are interested need to be able to find you and know where you are. And that's, that's, the, key. that's, yeah. that's the key. And then having these silly numbers so that good shows will invite you. So follow <laughs> me, follow me. Follow y'all. No, everyone follow her. We'll, we'll definitely post the links, like I said, so everyone can, can follow you and see how awesome you really are. I always feel like somebody's watching me. No, oh, wait, no, that's not follow me, but whatever. Anyway. Yes. All right, y'all, thanks for watching another episode of Hollywood Interviews. Thank you, Beatrice. And I uh, hope we can have you back on. And yeah, y'all go support her. Uh, yeah, this is amazing. Uh, all right, well, catch y'all later. All righty.